pivoted exclusively to doing ground up new construction development because we find that if we underwrite it correctly and minimize the risk of where we're building, that we can build to a much higher yield than if we were to buy an existing building at today's yields and today's cap rates. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Our guest today, actually for numerous segments, is going to dive into development, ground up construction. What is that? What are some things that you need to know, whether you are an active operator or whether you are a passive investor, you're going to learn a lot from these segments that are crucially important as you invest in ground up and new construction. His name is Michael Zaransky. He's a founder and managing partner of MZ Capital Partners. He specializes in ground-up construction that caters to by-choice renters and workforce housing. By strategically building with their target demo in mind, adding over-the-top amenities and keeping it at an affordable price, MZ Capital has successfully taken a projected 18-month stabilization forecast down to 100% occupancy on a 100-plus unit complex in under 90 days. I, and I hope you just heard that. I mean, that's that's typically not heard of, uh, but he's going to go into that. We're going to talk about that in one of the segments. He's also published numerous articles, lectured nationally in real estate investments. He's he's written books, uh, numerous books, and one called Profit by Investing in Student Housing and Purchase Rehab and Reposition Commercial Investment Property, Real Estate Category Bestsellers, published by Kaplan Publishing and, and sold, obviously, on Amazon, major bookstores uh, and sellers. But you are going to learn a lot from Michael today. If you are, like I said, if you're an active operator or you're passive, either one, you're going to learn a lot from this segment of interviews with Michael going into the do's and don'ts about many different aspects of ground up. So there's going to be some preliminary stuff we're going to talk about about ground up. We're going to get into government uh, approvals and entitlements and man, how they do it. Uh, how they're proactive in making that happen. You're going to learn a lot. Uh, and then even amenities, what what works, what doesn't, and why. Uh, and then even getting to why certain submarkets might work and why not as well, uh, and how they look at the exact market they're going to go into. You're going to learn a lot today from Michael and I. Michael, welcome to the show. Honored to have you on. You know, it's not often we have guys on who are experts in development or ground up construction. And and so I'm looking forward to diving into that. I know there's a lot of listeners who are thinking, hey, maybe I could do that sometime in the future. Or is that for me? Or well, what is it really? You know, or how do I learn how to do that? And I know we're going to dive into some of that with you. So welcome. Let's dive into who Michael is though first. And, and then we'll get into what is ground up construction. But how did you get into ground up construction and give us some background? Sure. My firm is based in the Chicago metropolitan area, MZ Capital Partners. We are a multi-generational firm. My uh, son is the fourth generation in our family to be in real estate, multifamily apartments. He's a member of our firm, a principal in our firm, so I'm the third generation. And I've been through the gamut over the years of various aspects and pivoted as time changed in the real estate business. Focusing on multifamily, but riding the condominium conversion phase, the renovation of apartments, buying existing stabilized properties and adding value and improving them, as well as doing brand new construction projects, largely of garden style suburban communities with a number of buildings and clubhouses and on site management. And of late, we have found given the market, and given valuations that existing stabilized properties are bringing at very low cap rates, that in the last five years or so, we pivoted exclusively to doing ground up new construction development because we find that if we underwrite it correctly and minimize the risk of where we're building, that we can build to a much higher yield than if we were to buy an existing building at today's yields and today's cap rates. Okay, that's incredible. I want to jump into that and just how you have lowered the risk and you know, and how you're you're that. I mean, I love that focus on whatever it may be as well. Like we we believe this, we know this. This is why we're moving this direction. And so I want to jump into that. But first, what does that mean to you? You know, somebody says ground up construction, and uh, you know, maybe we can talk about that. You know, you all have done different things, right, in real estate, especially over 
you know, the fourth generation is now part of the business. That's incredible, by the way. No doubt you all have had your hand in lots of different asset classes, potentially, or, or done different things. But maybe speak to ground up construction, you know, versus heavy renovations, you know, and just what ground up construction is. Right. Well, I mean, the obvious differentiating factor and starting point is uh, in buying an existing building with heavy renovation. You're working with an in-place infrastructure, in-place ceiling heights, in, in-place sewer and water capacity, uh, walls, bearing walls, and you're kind of limited as to what you can do. One of the things that I love about ground up new construction is that we're really dealing with a blank slate. So we're able to create a property with the amenities and a structure that appeals to today's top uh, amenities and what a renter's looking for. We typically find and purchase either a raw piece of land, which is in the areas we like to develop kind of rare, or a piece of land that has a use on it that's really either obsolete or no longer producing enough revenue. We've bought properties that have old rundown motels on them and wrecked them. We've bought properties that have an old tire repair center and wrecked them. And occasionally we find a, a true piece of raw land and improvement and literally start from the ground up which is uh, why it's called ground up new construction and put in the infrastructure, including the sewer and water capacity and the electric capacity, the underground lines that go into the foundation of the buildings and then design buildings and amenities that meet today's standards, what renters are searching for. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, sometimes, or like you mentioned, there's already some kind of structure there. You're even, you're kind of having to start before the ground up, right? I mean, you're having to demolish something or demo something and go through a big process before even being able to start your project, potentially. You know, you mentioned putting in sewer and infrastructure and those processes. I want to get into those as well. But maybe, you know, as we do that, you could walk listeners through some steps involved in, you know, building a ground up commercial building and, uh, you know, even maybe even start like with that tire business or whatever it was, you know, you're having to remove that structure potentially. I'm sure there's things you're having to consider as you're thinking about this old business that were there. I was thinking about whether, you know, fuel stations and things like that that have stuff underground and, oh man, you know, there's many things you're going to have to think through before maybe you build a residential property there, right? So maybe walk us through some of those steps that are involved in ground up commercial and what the listeners should be thinking about it, especially if they're considering moving into that asset class or, you know, being able to start doing ground up on their own when maybe they've been buying existing multifamily or something like that. Yes, there's a lot. And you mentioned some of the concerns. There are many concerns from start to finish, even to getting to the breaking ground stage. And typically, unlike starting with an existing structure where once you close, you actually have the keys and you have a revenue producing property. There's a very long timeline in the development process. And the first part or some of the things that you referred to are the pre-development stage, which takes a number of months. It takes a number of months after getting a piece of property tied up on a contract with some due diligence period, putting up some earnest money, do the due diligence necessary to see what will fit on the land, to actually spend some money with engineers to look at that in, those infrastructure needs, spend some money with an architect for some preliminary plans as to what can be built. And as you mentioned, one of those items is environmental issues. The tire repair place is an obvious one, but any piece of land that's going to be re reused requires at least a phase one. And then if there are issues going on to a phase two and perhaps drilling some borings to make sure there's nothing miserable underneath the ground that needs to be cleaned up and that needs to be factored in the cost. It's also important, regardless of the environmental condition of the site, to do soil sampling and uh, borings in order for our construction crews and our general contractor to be able to assess the ability to build the foundation and how big of a building that ground will support. It's one of the due diligence items we look at. And we spend a lot of time throughout the process, typically 
working with a local municipality to make sure they're receptive to the concept of multifamily. And in almost 100% of the cases, it's very, very rare to find a site that is fully zoned and entitled as a matter of right to support a multifamily use. So getting the entitlements from the local municipality and going through their process is also part of that due diligence period. When you do ground up construction, like I'm describing, and become a developer, there are considerable pre-development costs. We call them chase costs, some of the things I outlined that you just have to go at risk for in advance. And knowing that there's a possibility that you may have a deal that, for whatever reason, does not move forward. That's certainly one of the risks, and it requires some initial capital that you're willing to risk on the deal. If the deal goes, you can absorb it, but if it doesn't, well, you've got a write-off of <laughs> chase costs. <laughs> yeah, that's so many things to think through, and I know we're going to talk about a number of them over you know, a series of shows here, but that, that's a great sure. start, and to help us start thinking about that, and I think that's probably... One of those risks, right, or something, especially someone getting started, you know, is considering when they think about those pre-development or chase costs. And can you speak to, you know, as far as maybe there's a way that you could give us to help think through what to expect on those costs. I know it could be so in the air, you know, so much in the air about what might happen, what might have to be done, you know, depending on the the project itself. Is there a way up front though? Because I know you don't always know exactly what you're getting into, right? When you may begin a process like that. Yeah. But how do you all, I guess, justify and think through the risk of the amount of that pre-development cost? Yeah, well, the first thing we do because of those costs, and it's, it's hard, as you mentioned, to exactly quantify, but we have a general idea, having done this a number of times, um, about what it would cost per deal, which I'll share in a minute. But one of the things we do before we start pulling the trigger on spending money is we do a couple things before that uh, to help ensure our success. The first is we look at the market that we've targeted and we make sure that existing rent levels are at a sufficiently high margin that it could be profitable to build and move forward with the project. We also look at occupancy rates of other existing apartment communities in the submarket to make sure that they're running at high occupancy levels and there's not a lot of vacancy, which tells us that there's demand in a marketplace for it. And then we, of course, first deal with the sellers of the properties that we're engaged in. And the good news and the bad news is it's sometimes a lengthy process to get under contract and to convince them to go under contract with a subject to a due diligence period that is typically longer than a straight up sale of a stabilized product. That's because we need time for all these things and to put up some earnest money with them that's refundable up to the due diligence period. But the good news is that after you get past that hurdle, if you have a seller that understands the process and why it takes time, you have time internally to figure these things out and to gradually pull the trigger on expenses rather than diving in all at once to gradually take it a step at a time. So after we take care of getting comfortable with the market and actually tying up the land, we will actually go and we've learned to make a call to the director of planning or development at the local municipality we're dealing with. We usually go in in person and have a meeting and share our plans for the site and get a reaction from the city, whether or not they'd be amenable to it. They sometimes don't tell you on the spot, but they'll get back to you after they've talked to some of the people on the planning commission and after they've talked to their local city council. And that feedback is very, very important because in our case, at least, if we get feedback back from a city that they have no interest in multifamily on that particular piece, or they're not willing to support it, we actually pull the plug at that point before we start spending money. We have found the old saying, you can't fight City Hall to be true. 
We only move forward with a project and go through all the various steps if we know that at least the planning department in the city will support our project and our concept. That makes a lot of sense. I'm looking forward to getting in, into that even more in the next segment. We're going to talk a lot about the local government and the approvals, entitlements, and, and some of those things even more. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, though, too, you know, you mentioned, and, and I know most listeners are going to know some of this, but you mentioned like long timeline, right? Like, Could you just give some details there around maybe some projects, why they were a faster timeline, or maybe why some really drug out longer than you all sure. expected? Sure. I think most of that has to do not on the professional services part, like once we get going with our architect and engineer, they can work very fast and keep the timeline going as quick as possible. Internally, we can do things as quick as possible, no matter how much due diligence we need to do, it can get done fairly quickly. The timeline for a project is really, for us at least, and in my experience, more contingent on the responsiveness and the turnaround times of the city or municipality we're dealing with. A lot of them want to see preliminary plans or even final engineering plans before they'll let you apply for a hearing for a zoning change. And sometimes they have comment period if they're backlogged or have a very small staff or have a lot of other projects could be a couple months. And sometimes they work very quickly and it could be a couple of weeks. So it's really an unknown when you're getting into it. But generally where you have a city on board and enthused about the project, we find them and our professionals work with the staff, we find them to be reasonably diligent and receptive. The other thing that matters a lot, you know, as, as we can get into it, is a topic in and of itself is the, is the public hearing process and the neighbors and maneuvering through that process and getting them on board. And that sometimes can delay a project or not. We try and make that as smooth as possible. So it really is dependent on the reaction for the city uh, we're dealing with and also, frankly, where the site is. If it's, if it's in a commercial area or what was formerly a commercial area and there aren't a lot of residential neighbors, usually goes quicker. If there are residential neighbors, they rightfully want to know a lot of details about the project that come to public hearings, and the process is longer. Okay. No, that's awesome. And we may talk about the public hearing process a little more as well, because I feel like it's a very important part of the process, right? And so yeah. at least knowing that up front, uh, depending on the type of project or location, but also, you know, when you're thinking about uh, all these expenses, all these things you're having to do in the pre-development stage, you know, or the chase costs, you know, what's the timeline of that and say getting a project under contract typically? I'll give you an example. We're currently working on a project also happens to be in suburban Chicago, although we do other markets as well. We went under contract for the property. It was a three parcel assemblages with two sellers. One seller was uh, more difficult than the other on terms of the contract and some of the back and forth with the attorneys. It took about two and a half months to get under contract. By the first of the year, this year, we were under contract on the properties, met with the village second week of January, engaged our consultants, and we just one week ago in August of 22 received our final approval from their city council. So from start to finish, eight months in 22 and about three months in 21 of negotiating with the seller. So that's 11 months. We'll close on that property in October and begin moving dirt and doing site work in October. And it'll take about 12 to 15 months to build it. So you're looking at quite a timeline and quite an investment, a couple of years from start to finish until you start pre-leasing. But as I mentioned, we find that the time and the commitment to it is well worth it in terms of the yield versus buying an existing property. And speak also to the, you had mentioned early on about, you know, why you all like ground up and you talked about the lowered risk, you know, because the business plan or the location, those things. Could you elaborate on that some? Sure. We do a fair amount of uh, detailed analysis and we only operate in 
the sub-markets that we've been in and are really comfortable with knowing the market on. And then we use outside third-party sources to support our own research. We fortunately are all now in an industry where there's lots of data available, accurate data for through places like CoStar and Yardi and some others, where there's really comprehensive reporting on rent rates and even apartments.com, which happens to be owned by CoStar, a great place to do rent surveys in any sub-market. You can draw a little map around our site and go out one mile, three miles, or five miles and identify virtually every comp apartment complex there is. There's data on the age of those properties and the amenities and the rent. You can quickly figure out what a rent per square foot is in that market so that we can begin to uh, do a pro forma income and expense statement. And we actually, once we get to the stage where we're rolling and we're starting to spend money on engineering and architectural plans, we get our general contractor involved in pricing and we also engage one of several third-party independent market research firms that do a market study for us. They really are relatively cost-effective, not as much as someone would think. The great data on the market, what the future demand is, on employment trends, on rents, and they confirm our rent assumptions. Also, very, very useful report to have when it comes time to for uh, making a presentation to the lenders for financing for the project, where instead of just listening to the developer's story, the bank can rely on an independent third party's data and analysis. And that gives us a real good feeling for at least in today's dollars, what our revenue will be once the project is finished. Okay, go ahead. We then, we then obviously have to construct on the income and expense statement, the expense side of it. We're pretty good at that. So are our appraisers that we have relationships with because of the number of properties we operate. We have an idea of what it costs in each category to operate in today's dollars, a finished community. And from that, we're able to come up with a realistic projection of what net operating income will be. Speak to, you know, maybe the listener who is looking again at getting into this space and maybe just a couple tips on alleviating, you know, as many, as much downside or risk, you know, potential as they can, as far as learning ground up as they begin the process. I think the best way to learn as I did, and I think, you know, it's just kind of intuitive if you think about it is regardless of your financial ability or your ability to attract equity or debt. I would do something small. I would do a project small and learn about all these pieces. You know, maybe do a six unit building in an environment where there's other uh, similar sized apartments or similar sized buildings. Perhaps it's easier on a small site to find something that's already zoned. So you eliminate that whole process of entitlements that I talked about just so you can roll up your sleeves and get going and use that to kind of hone the skills and get a good architect, you know, a good engineering firm on board and a professional team that can help you marshal the project. I, I would definitely start small and the quick, what I call like the back of the envelope down and dirty that we always use to check our deals is you'll, you'll be able to get an idea and reach a point of how much per unit it costs to build the thing. And once you have that number, do your research in the market, talk to brokers, look at reported sales and see what other buildings are selling for on a per unit basis. And if your cost to construct is lower than the selling price, which I think you'll find in today's market, you've got yourself a winner and you've got the downside risk covered. So despite the elaborate method I just went through, that's always my default. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. No doubt, uh, you learn so much and less risk, less capital involved. And, and we talked about potentially even buying the land after it's been entitled, 
And, you know, would you say that's a, uh, as far as buying the land after it's been entitled, that means that you're, uh, somebody else has really taken a lot of that, that chase cost risk, right? The pre-development cost risk. They've purchased that land, they've gone through that process, uh, and then they're going to sell it to somebody that's going to do the actual development piece then, right? So they're going to make, they're going to make some profit on that and then maybe hand it off to somebody that wants to take it the rest of the way. Is that correct? There is uh, a market for that. There are several markets where there are developers that will do that. We don't. I've never been comfortable with the risk of closing on a piece of land until it's unless it's entitled. But if somebody had the ability and the risk tolerance to do that, there is no question that a piece of land is worth a lot more after it's zoned for multifamily and through the entitlement process than it was when it was initially bought. Okay. No, that's awesome. Well, Michael, a great first segment, just really helping us dive into some of the things we should be thinking about as we learn about ground up uh, construction development, and maybe the listeners thinking about adding this to their portfolio, or maybe the the passive investors even considering investing in a project like this. And it's going to help them to have better questions to ask that operator as well, right? You know, as far as ensuring that operator has this experience, at least on their team, or they've thought through these things. And so it's been helpful to say the least. Looking forward to getting in the next segment also, so where we can dive into the local government approvals and entitlements and what that looks like. We've mentioned a little bit about it, but it's a delicate process as well, right? And so I want to dive into that in just a moment. But Michael, thank you again, and we will talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you, Whitney. Take care. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope you have liked and subscribed to the show. Please tell your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show, and I hope that you are learning and growing. Don't forget to go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing today.